current vacation day was actually going to be the day I was going to be presenting. Um, and I, I, I have pulled those kind of things off, but this time, by the time I would have been landing, there would have, it would have been too late. You guys would have been sitting here empty. So I, I had to, and I didn't realize until the last minute, so I had to ping Michael and I was hoping he didn't cave in. And he didn't. <laughs> And That's I right. also told him, well, we might not be able to do it again because I was in the process of possibly moving to China. So we said, we'll play it by ear and we'll see what happens. So originally, if my original plan had worked out, uh, I would be in Shanghai right now, living there. But that's not happening. But there is some other interesting things happening, which I'll talk about with you in a minute. Um, so very excited to be here. Um, certainly, I'm very fortunate a lot of the things I've been able to be part of at Microsoft, and I'm really appreciative of that. And of course, it was not just me, but I was one person who was at least able to be very active and vocal. And um, even doing what we're doing now with Script CS, which is uh, which we'll talk about, which is not the project that I work on as part of my day job; it's just an open source project, um, has also been kind of about trying to shift things and, and get people to look at uh, different ways of developing with the platform. So that's what we're going to really talk about today. But I thought I'd start with a quick intro about me. So as you heard, I worked at Microsoft for eight years. My most recent project, I've worked on a lot of projects. I've moved around quite a bit at Microsoft. As a matter of fact, um, in eight years, I think I've been in seven different positions. Some of those have been related to reorgs, uh, which is a popular thing that happens at Microsoft. But um, the Node stuff was uh, one of the most recent projects I was on, which has been really, really interesting. It's been great getting a chance to try to just bring other stacks that you know, Microsoft originally had no care about and really try to get those to work um, in our cloud which has been, and, and, and on the Windows platform, which has been really awesome. And recently, I worked on the Azure Mobile Services team. I don't know if anybody here has heard of the Azure Mobile Services team. So I've been on that team for about six, eight months. So, um, but, but the last couple of months have really been a big time of change for me. So uh, one of the things that I've been trying to change is I've had this kind of queasiness around heights um, since I was a little kid. I've never been terrified of heights, but I've had this kind of queasiness. So I decided it would be good to try to tackle that head on. Um, so I jumped off the Sky Tower in New Zealand, which is 500 feet, and uh, I went skydiving. Uh, all of this happened within the last five months, and about four months before that I started rock climbing. And I'm no longer afraid of heights or even queasy on heights, which, is, uh, which has been a good thing. But uh, it's also just been a time of change and trying out new things. And so I just tweeted this today. So one of the things I'm going to be trying out is life outside Microsoft. So I'm, I'm, I am really appreciative, like I said, of the, of the eight years that I've been at Microsoft. It's been fantastic. It's enabled me to take my next step. And I won't be standing here marketing around that. But uh, this is where you'll find me very, very soon. Um, anybody here familiar with Splunk? Yeah. So I'll be working on the dev experience for Splunk. So if you're a developer and you're using Splunk, or you want to use Splunk as a developer, or you're not happy with the experience, whatever it is, you can just find me. That's supposed to be a blue screen, but hopefully that won't get in the way. Um, so now done with all that who am I and all that stuff, and thank you again for Worthy praise. Um, so, scripts, yes. So, I've been developing with C Sharp since the betas uh, of .NET, and I love it. It's an awesome language, really, really powerful. As a matter of fact, recently I was doing some Android development, and that just reminded me how much I love C Sharp. Um, things like uh, the way the language has evolved to um, do type interpolation, you know, being able to use the bar keyword, I found myself really missing that as I was doing Android development. But, link, async await. I mean, it's just a fantastic language. It doesn't get the credit that it should. Kudos to Miguel for trying to get us that credit. And he's doing some really cool stuff. I mean, C-sharp, look at it. It really is going everywhere now. If you look at the work that Xamarin guys are doing, um, being able to write iOS apps, Android apps, and people are doing it. You know, it's not just a hypothetical. So C-sharp is an awesome language. Done. But sometimes it feels heavy. Now, what I mean that feels heavy is not the language, it's the development experience of using C Sharp. Like when? Well, sometimes I just want a prototype. I just want to play with something. All I want to do actually is I read about a cool API and I want to see it working. 
And how much does it take me to get to the place where I can just execute a line of code? I need to open up Visual Studio. I need to have Visual Studio or Express or something installed on my machine. Um, then I need to open Visual Studio and make a lot of decisions, like what kind of project am I going to make? If I make a console project, well, then I have to have a main method and a class where I'm going to put that. Now, the code gen generates it for me, but it's still a lot of stuff. And I get like hundreds of files, even for a one-liner, <laughs> because of everything that VS creates for me, the project system and the designer files and all of that other stuff. Um, and it just goes up from there depending on what the project is. Like if I write a WPF app, all I want to do is have a button and click it to run some code. It's just really exploding uh, the amount of stuff I have to do when all I want to do is just write a line of code and run it. And then there are times when I want to do some kind of automation thing where I just want to like write a little console app or something like that. And again, I have to have all this stuff when all I may want to do is call a couple of lines of code. Um, and then there's other things like diagnostics and interactivity that I may want to do where I want to like um, maybe make some HTTP calls to a server. I can do that with Fiddler, but Fiddler is great for just doing HTTP requests. But if I want to like write some code or do something more sophisticated than that, I either have to learn something new. And people here are using PowerShell might raise their hand and say, oh, what about PowerShell? But that's something new. I want to be able to use the thing that I know. So. That really became intensified when I started to look around um, at other dynamic languages that are out there. And that's what got me thinking about this, what if we could have a low-cal option? Now, before I dig into the low-cal option I'm going to be showing you, and just to set a disclaimer, I'm not trying to say you have to use this, you should use this. I'm just going to show you something that I've been working on, a bunch of people really like it, and why we built it, and how it works. And it's totally up to you. We'll still be friends if you decide that you don't want to use this. Um, so if we look around at dynamic languages in particular, like Ruby, Python, and for me, it was really apparent from Node, because I was working with Node for two years, what do I need to do to write a Ruby program or a Node program? Well, first, I don't even need to necessarily write a program. I can just go into this REPL, uh, reply val print which is just like a little command line utility where I can just go in and just start typing some code, and typing commands, and seeing what's going on immediately. Um, but if I want to actually write a program, that is like I need a text editor and a text file, and I can go. And all of these also have package managers associated with them. So I don't have to have a big footprint necessarily installed on my machine. And Node is actually the lightest. Because for Node, you have a single executable or a single binary if you're on a Mac or Linux. So it really does take the cake in that respect. And so you really can get started with a bare minimum. You have freedom to choose what editor you want to use. People use Emacs, people use VI. People haven't really been doing this with C Sharp because there just hasn't been a good experience for it. So what really Script CS has done is if you look at the Node developer experience, there's these two primary components in terms of uh, what you use when you build applications. There's the runtime in Node, which is very, very small. Which, like I said, it's a single EXE. It has a lot of the core functionality you need to enable other things. Like, it has APIs for accessing the file system. But it doesn't have everything under the sun. That all comes in through another means, which is called NPM, the Node Package Manager. So it's like a really lightweight core, and then you have all these packages that you can pull from. Um, the nice thing about that is, you know, like every time Microsoft builds a framework and puts it in the box, it's like that's the thing you're going to use by default. You have to like really go out of your way to look outside of that. Whereas in the Node world, because the Node core team was really, really disciplined, they really said, let's leave it up to the community to decide what the right way to do X is. And there's not just one right way, so it puts everything on an even keel. So in Node, after I do the basics and I want to install a web server, I have lots of different choices, but it's not like if I'm in a company that's doing Node, my boss comes to me and says, oh, you need to use this one because that's the one that's built in. No, there's, there's choice there. So the salient points here, uh, can we darken or darken, I don't know. Uh, can you guys read that? Okay, um, so the salient points about the Node developer experience are there's no IDE required, there's no project, it's a minimum install, everything else is a package. So then I started to think, 
going back to that picture of the goat, and say, well, what do we have in C-sharp? And things have progressed since the last time I thought about this. Because the last time I thought about this, it was like, there's this utility called CSC. Anybody here heard of CSC? CSC is the C-sharp compiler. It's actually what Visual Studio will invoke when you go to compile stuff. But it's not friendly for me to use by hand. I have to start doing a lot. Like, it's, it's OK if I have just a file that I want to execute. I still have to have a main, though. I can't just do a DLL because I need something to actually run it. I need to have an entry point. So I still have more work that I have to do. But it really starts to get complicated when I start adding references. Because I have to type out all those references and what DLLs they are and what location they're in, uh, which means that they either have to be in the GAC, which is horrible, or I have to like copy all that stuff locally. So that was just a non-starter for that kind of approach. Though some people used it, they created batch files. Um, there are other things like LinkPad, which traditionally LinkPad has been great for like interactive stuff, really around queries and things like that. But if I wanted to write programs with it, it wasn't great for, for that kind of experience. Also not open source, you have to buy it. Um, doesn't mean it's bad. So, I started to think about C-sharp, and the first thing that hit me was, wait a minute, hold the phone, we actually do have a packaging system now. It's called NuGet. And the, the winds have really shifted, where now both coming out of Microsoft and pretty much any open source project that's anything is going to be a package. So we now have, now we don't have the small core like we had with, with Node, but we have the .NET framework, which by default is usually installed anyway. So we have the .NET framework installed on the machine, and now we have NuGet packages. And then I started to think about, but what about the lightweight authoring experience? What about not needing Visual Studio? Um, what about not needing a project? And it turns out we actually do have something for that. So we have this new technology called Roslyn. And Roslyn is compiler as a service. Now, to give credit, Mono has had a C-sharp compiler open source that didn't need project files for a very long time. It's called the Mono CS compiler. Um, but Roslyn came on the scene, and what Roslyn does is, Roslyn is really the next generation compiler for within Visual Studio itself. You'll see this roll out over the next couple of years. But it gives you the ability to simply give it some code, and it will turn it into a DLL. It can compile it in memory, or it can compile it to disk. Um, but the other thing that it introduced that is really cool is a lightweight, scripty way of doing C Sharp. And what I mean by that is I kept talking about how if I'm going to write C Sharp and I'm going to write like a console app or something like that, I have to have a main. I have to have a class. Whereas if I use Ruby, Python, and JavaScript, I don't. I could simply have, you know, int a equals one in JavaScript with nothing else and that will run. Console.write, uh, console.log a, for example, that will run. Well, Roslyn brings a procedural way. Now, we used to think procedural was a bad thing, and it's funny watching the way the pendulum shifts. But it turns out that when you're trying to get started or just trying to get something simple done, being able to just write procedural code is actually not that bad. And when you can mix and match, it's even more powerful, which I will show you. So Roslyn brings that ability to have procedural code where I could just simply write, and you'll see me do this, console.writeline whatever, write a couple of uh, calls, and it just works. So that's really cool about Roslyn. Roslyn does other things, though. It does things to replace what's missing that the project file brings you. So Roslyn has these things called directives. So if you're using a script and you want to reference something, something in the GAC, for example, like you want to use the new HTTP client, which lives in system.net.http, DLL. You can do what's called a pound R. And a pound R is a way to say, bring into this class file a reference. So it's now removing the need for the project file, and it's localizing where those references are defined. It's easy for GAC, because you just type the DLL name. It gets a little bit uglier if you're not in the GAC, because then you get back to, you still need to put that file somewhere and copy it manually, which is, you know, when I used, looked at the Node experience, the thing that really impressed me about it was, how little I was actually doing. So although with Rosalyn I do have this pound R thing, to be able to get to the place where I could use it, I still have to do quite a bit of work. Um, one of the things Rosalyn doesn't have today in the box is the ability to include different kinds of files. 
So what you end up with is a gigantic file that has a ton of stuff, which is okay for simple things, but if you want to get any kind of reuse, it's not great for doing that in the box today. Some of that may change over time. So that's Roslyn. But one of the coolest things that the Roslyn team did, they did not take a dependency on Visual Studio to use it. Roslyn ships as a NuGet package, which is what Script CS is going to use, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and that means that you don't have to have VS installed on your machine to be able to use Roslyn. You just have to be able to have access to NuGet to install the Roslyn NuGet packages. And that is, without that, Script CS would have almost no story. Because we would say, oh, it's really cool. You don't have to work with Visual Studio, but you must have Visual Studio installed on your machine. <laughs> that would be a little bit self-defeating. So where Script CS comes in is to tie the missing link. The other thing, I forgot to mention a key thing. So on the bottom you see that NuGet diagram. What is missing from this combination here is the two are not connected. So I can go and install some NuGet packages and they will expand into these package folders. Anybody who's familiar with NuGet knows that's not a simple path to remember. It's like going to be like the package, it's going to be really long. The package name, and it's going to drill in, it's going to be really hideous. So I could conceptually use pound R, but I would have to know the name also of every DLL in the package, which kind of self-defeats the point of having a package. So I look at this and I was like, okay, really cool that we've got this Roslyn thing, really cool that we've got NuGet, can we blend them together? Can we get to a place where I can write script and leverage NuGet packages, but thinking about that node experience, which really was strong in my head, um, get to that place where I don't even have to really think about it, where it just works. And that is what Script CS is about. So Script CS is about tying, and, and it goes a little bit further than that because ultimately it will not be dependent, it is not dependent on Roslyn. That's been part of an evolution. But Roslyn is the only default at this stage of the game. And what it gives you is the ability to write scripts. You can write them loose, you can write them as classes. And you can utilize NuGet packages in a very seamless, easy way. And we'll see how that works. So that's what we're going to go into the rest of the time here. Um, feel free to ask questions. How much time do we have, by the way? Uh, we usually go about 45 minutes and then 15 minutes question and answer, but it's squishy. OK. Because I could go way longer. So I'll just gauge the audience and see how they feel as we go. Um, so the script CS developer experience, this is the same exact diagram, or, or it's not really a diagram, the same exact bullet points that we had for <coughs> Node, which is basically saying, hey, you don't need an IDE, you can use any editor, you don't need a project, it's a minimal install on top of what you already have, that's a big difference, but we'll assume that it's already there, and after that, everything is a package. So let's see it in action. And feel free to ask whatever questions that you want. Um, that tens is Tech Ed New Zealand, so these slides are basically very similar, if not identical, to the slides I used in my Tech Ed talk. Um, so just getting started, hello world. So the way that you install Script CS, the easiest way to install Script CS is it, a bit, is, it is available on Chocolatey. This, you guys know this is a Mac, so there's no point in hiding it. And so, <laughs> if you go to here, you can type script CS, and you will see that once you have chocolatey installed, which it gives you a really simple command for doing that right from a shell, what chocolatey is, is like an app manager. So if you've worked on, the, on Linux, for example, there's things like app get, and an app get is a way to basically just install applications on your machine from the command line, and there's like a repository where they're published. NuGet is a great way to do that with libraries. Chocolatey provides the equivalent for being able to actually install apps, things that will actually run at your command line. And so you can get script CS once you have Chocolatey installed, simply with this one command, cinst script CS. And so once you do that, um, so I have this script CS folder, which is empty. So now we want to get started. So let's just get started with the simplest thing we could do. 
So I'm going to uh, start up Sublime Text. For those of you that don't like using, or don't even know what Sublime is, it's a very cool editor. And one of the things that's really cool about Sublime is it actually has support for Script CS. There's a plugin for Script CS, which you'll see in action in a minute. All right. So I've got this start, that's CSX here, and all I'm going to do is write console.writeline. Hello. So you can see that's color coded, and that's part of what the um, script CS plugin for Sublime Text will give you. So it's there. And so now I can go back to PowerShell. I don't have to be in PowerShell, by the way. I'm just using PowerShell as the shell when I'm launching Script CS. Script CS has no dependency on using PowerShell whatsoever. You can definitely run this from your standard command prompt. So I'm going to say Script CS start that CSX. It's going to say hello. Um, we're not going to be working mostly at the command line because one of the nice things, if you use the Sublime plugin for Script CS, is it will actually run right from within. Sublime text. So you can just write code and you can hit control B and it will run it for you. Which is nice because then you get this kind of split screen where you can see the output. Uh, but we will be coming back to that. Okay, so, so what you see right here is I told you about how Rosalind brings this procedural code model. And you can see that here. There's no class, there's no main method, just some simple code in it. And it can be stateful. I mean, this is all full-blooded C-sharp, right? So I can say bar A equals hello. And then I can write that out. So I just defined a variable. Um, pretty much everything you can expect you can do with three limitations. You can't write static classes. And the reason for that is because although this, although I'm not writing a class here, behind the scenes, a class is actually getting created. Because the way the CLR works, it requires a class to be present. So the way that Roslyn works is it brings a bunch of syntactic sugar. Um, and our compilers do that anyway. I mean, when you write 4-H, go look at the IL for what gets generated. <laughs> if you use async await, go look at the IL. So this is not something new. This has been around a long time that we do lots of tricks to make things easier. And Roslyn does that as well. But what I can do now, which is pretty cool, is I can then intermix this with functions. So I can say, you know, public void. Um, one of the things that's also, by the way, nice about this uh, particular, if you install the Sublime plugin for Script CS, is we actually have completion. So, uh, guy named Aaron Powell, Slace on Twitter, has gone and put in a bunch of expansion snippets that just help you doing things. Or like, if I want to write a class, I can say public class and tab, and I get a class. So he's copied basically all the snippets that are available in VS, like the comp for core ones. Um, and you know, this is open source, so you can easily contribute to add more. But one of the things I'm going to do is, which I don't think he has, is write a function. So I'm going to write a function called greet. And I'm going to have it take a parameter called message. And then I'm going to just move this in. And I'm going to write out the message. Just to make sure that this is actually doing something. Let's say, hello again, hello. I don't know what's up. Anybody knows what I was actually saying? <coughs> so I didn't do anything. But you see, it didn't fail. So it compiled this greet function. So now what I can do is um, say greet A. So I was now able to go from starting with just simple procedural code to move into a function. And the order doesn't actually matter here, because what happens is, um, what is happening behind the scenes, just to give you guys an insight, Roslyn always creates an outer class. Anything that you define in that script will be a member of that outer class, including if you actually define classes, which we're going to see in a second. Those actually become inner classes of that outer class. That's why you cannot have static uh, classes, because of the fact that you 
you can't have a static class within an either non-static class. Um, so that is um, that is what's happening behind the scenes, and all of this raw pr this procedural code that I write here goes into a special function that gets generated when Roslyn creates that class, and that's why the order here doesn't matter. Even though I'm defining the function first, or I'm defining the function second, if you think about the ultimate class that will get created, there'll be some type of initialize method where that procedural code will sit, and that's why the order doesn't matter. Just to give you an insight into what's happening behind the scenes. So now what I could do though is go further. I could now say that I want to actually write a class called greeter, and I'm just going to move this method in. And now I'm going to say var greeter equal to new greeter. And I'll say greeter dot greet. And we'll just use the A again. Yeah, that should work. I'll find out. So now it's getting richer. And I think this is a key thing that Script CS brings to the table, is this ability to incrementally get more <coughs> complex as you need to, add more artifacts as you need to, and still be able to mix and match them, like the way I still have procedural code here, missing, mixing with a class. Um, now, one of the things I can also do, <coughs> a common pattern that we've seen people ask about is, I want to actually write command line tools. So imagine greeter is a little utility. And what I really want is that message to come in as a parameter, as an argument, when I run script CS. Now this is not going to work from within Sublime because I haven't figured out yet how to set command parameters, but we'll go back to the command line to show this. So what I'm going to do now is um, hopefully I well, I did a refactoring, so I may actually be off here. Let me let me just double check something for a second. I just updated to a more recent version. when you've worked on the project and you can jump back and forth to the code. All right. So what I'm going to do is instead of doing this A hello again, I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to set this to be script args zero. Now, because this is .NET, I could actually use environment.arguments. Um, but environment.arguments is going to give you everything that was passed. And some of these, script CS actually has its own parameters, like the name of the CSX file that you're running, and there's some other additional parameters. What script args does is it will only get custom parameters. And we have a way of connotating when I run a script that this is not a parameter that script CS understands, but it's something that I want to have accessible in the script because I want to do like a command line tool. So what I'm going to do now is just jump over here and I'm going to say script CS start. And the way that we do this is you actually put dash dash. So I'm just going to say hello from script CS and hope this works because I actually haven't tested it with this version, but it should. Okay. So that opens up a universe of where you could now write full fledged command line tools with script CS and you could just wrap them in a batch file and then you could have a batch file that has your name instead of the person having to know to write script CS, whatever. We actually want to make a way of automating that in the future so that you can actually tell script CS this is a command line tool and, then it, would know, and, and it would know basically to generate for you that wrapper so you could just type it at the shell. But, all right, so we've seen a bunch of cool stuff there. Um, one of the things that script CS has that's also really nice, so I talked about being able to just write code and how some of these dynamic languages have what's called a REPL, which is an interactive way to just run code. So we actually have that as well. So if you just type script CS by itself, you get into REPL mode. 
And in rebel mode, I can actually say console.myline hello. And I can also define variables, a equals foo. Because it's the rebel, I can actually, oh, what happened there? Oh, right, because I called it var a equals foo. So that's what errors look like. <laughs> you can see here now that I, if I just type the variable name, I actually get a nice little output. And I can even do things like new up, um, I can do um, anonymous types, you know, like foo equals bar. Oh, it's put semicolon. And now if I do b, you can see that it outputs it pretty nicely. But the REPL can do everything basically that you can do in the full form here. So I can basically define, I use basically too much. I was tweeting about this the other day. I apologize. Um, the tab completion doesn't work, but I could actually now go and do something multi-line here, like define my greeter. So public void greet string message. And you can see that it hasn't given me the arrow yet because it knows I'm in the middle of actually doing something. And then I can say uh, console.writeLine message. So that means that class is now available. So I can say var a equals to new greeter. That's a good question. So what happened there? Um, the way that Roslyn works, um, when you're in the REPL mode, it's actually creating new types for you all the time. Um, it will let you even redefine an existing variable, and you could save a pointer to it. So the reason why that is actually working is in the REPL mode, it will actually allow you to define the same variable again. And if you had saved an instance to the previous one, it will still exist. You can even redefine the same class. I could define greater again, and I could still have an instance pointing to the old one and the new one. This only works within the REPL. And the reason it works is because behind the scenes, Roslyn is generating these wrapper classes. Even though it looks like it actually is the same variable, it's actually a variable within a different class, and that's why it actually works. Um, you're just not seeing the wrapper class that's being generated behind the scenes. It generates these things called submissions. So in the REPL, each line that I write, basically, um, or if I define a class, it's actually generating for me a new submission class. So if I do like a.getType, you'll see that it has this submission 6 plus greeter. If I did b.getType, let's see what that has. It does this um, delta thing, um, what Rosalind does with these, with these submission types. So this one is not a submission because it's an anonymous type. Let's do, um, let's try another thing here. Let's see. Computer. Well, that would be the same type. Let's do this. Let's say public class creator again. This one will just leave empty. Say bar C equals to new greeter. Okay, so we have A, which is still there, and we have C, two different types, but the types are different. If I do C dot get type, you can see it's submission eleven. So these wrapper classes that are being generated, and this is just way too much detail that we don't have to get into, but because this is happening behind the scenes, it enables you to do some interesting things in the REPL that will not work though within a, within a within a script. Yes? Can you add references to new assemblies? We're going to get to that right now. Okay. Yeah, that's next. Um, <coughs> yes? One quick question about the REPL. How come we have to put a semicolon for a REPL experience? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, Actually, yeah, it's, it's because of the fact that we're using the C-sharp compiler, and C-sharp requires semicolon. Okay. It's not like JavaScript. 
I mean, it's actually proper. It's not a. It's not a lighter weight. Like it, the scripting experience is lighter weight, but semicolons themselves are not an option. Yeah. If I if I just said you know bar A equals one, that is coming from the. Yeah, but REPL would add it to that. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah. why doesn't the REPL add it? You did this mistake, so obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a possibility. Um, and we are and if you guys want to go to the GitHub repo, github.com slash <laughs> no, go file the bug. I'm not even saying we'll accept PRs. We're we're an open source project, but file the bug and you know we can we can we can talk about it. And then there's a question, I think the debate there is do we want to require the REPL to be symmetrical with the code that you type in your files or not? But yes, we could um, we could basically append um, a semicolon. Though it's actually going to get kind of ugly because if I write a class, let's say, and I write methods, that whole thing doesn't close off until the class. So we're going to have to get into string parsing everything that you write to add the semis and figuring out what's a line. It's it's not simple. It's simple for this case. No, for single single line. For single line, it's simple. But but again, as soon as you write a class which has methods that have lines within it. We'll have to parse those lines, parse the CRLFs, know if it's actually in the middle of a, of a function or a brace. It's not a lightweight thing to do, actually. Another thing, when you type mounting line or stuff like RAS, uh, there was no feedback as far as I see about how many closing braces you have to put, right? You kind of can get lost where you are. I mean, this is. That's true. And this is very similar to REPLs that you will find for other dynamic languages. It's just, this is just lightweight at the console giving you a means to be able to type code. It's not a full-fledged editor. Sublime will give you that. Sublime will actually show me here in that underline which, uh, which this matches against. So I can actually see that all of mine are matching off. Um, it's not a goal of the REPL to actually be a full-fledged rich editing experience. Okay, moving on. So what we've seen here is um, the ability to put everything in a single file. What if I want to expand that out? Really, I may want to have functions that are reusable, like this greeter function. Maybe I want to reuse across scripts. So um, before we get to the DLL references, which Chris was asking about, we actually have the ability to load other scripts, and we can do that in a recursive manner. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a new file, and I'm going to just copy this greeter definition in, and I'm going to save that as greeter CSS. <coughs> and then what we have the we have is a command called pound load. This is a directive, uh, and you can basically say greeter. <laughs> dot CSX. And directives don't use a semicolon. I haven't ran this in the REPL, but it should work. Let's see if it works. Oh no, it won't until I get rid of this. So let's say hello. So what we can see happen here is now instead of embedding the greeter within the file, I was able to move that off into a separate file. And I could also have loose functions combined with classes in there. And this is recursive, so I can actually have pound loads within greeter.csx that load up other things as well. Um, and I can use relative paths when I do pound load, so I can refer to subfolders and things like that. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you put all this stuff together. So that is the basics of what you can do as far as um, authoring and including other files. The one thing we didn't get to yet was the notion of references. I mentioned how we have great... No, you're fine. Give me like hand signals. Not yet. <laughs> Bloods in the crypts or... <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. So we've seen, um, we've seen how we can include files. What about assembly? So there's this directive called pound r. And with pound r, I can start to refer to things from the GAC or even local assemblies that I've dropped into a folder. So I'm going to do this one from the REPL because I want to show you an example. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run script CS. 
I'm going to put a pound R and I'm going to say system.net.http. And once I do that, that has gone into the gap. So the default is when you use pound R, if you don't put a DLL name and there's no path, it's going to assume that this is something coming out of the global assembly cache. So now I can do it using system.net.http. And one of the things that system.net.http has in .NET 4.5 is a new HTTP client, which allows me to make HTTP calls. So what I could then do is var client equal to new HTTP client. Now this is all async. So the HTTP client, every method basically returns task. So the $25,000 question is, does script CS support async await? Who thinks yes? Sure. Who thinks no? It does not. It does not <laughs> yet. And that is because we depend today on the Roslyn CTP. Well, we by default use the Roslyn CTP. The Roslyn CTP does not have two things yet. It does not have async await. It does not have dynamic. Um, both of those are point in time things. They're coming very, very soon. So if you use something with task, you have to work with the task, which is very easy to do for what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to say client um, dot get async, and then it's going to ask me for a URL. So this is not tech ed, so I'll say Google. <laughs> and then I'm going to say dot result, because this will return for me a task. One of the nice things, by the way, you get for free in the shell is it, and this is not something we did, this is just because whatever shell we're running in supports it, is uh, it remembers the last thing that you wrote. Yep, that was what it was. Good catch. I have no swag, but it's in my head. In my head, I've just given you a plus one. <laughs> So this is just dumping the results of the call, but you can see that it successfully made a call to Google.com, uh, Google and I've got all the headers there. I can access the content, access the body. I'm not going to do that now, but the point here was just to show you that, hey, I can access things in the global assembly cache. Uh, but I can go further than that, and this one may or may not rock your world. Um, so I'm going to go into our samples. And there's other things that are interesting in the gap, like WPF. So what could we do with WPF? So this is a WPF calculator. Everything is defined in script. There's no project. There's no designer files. This is actually utilizing the view model pattern, um, which WPF has you know, it's really easy to use WPF and, and apply view models. And so if I go into Sublime now and I add in this folder, if we take a look at what this is doing, just close that. All these pound R's are pulling in WPF from the GAC. All the assemblies that exist within WPF, system.xml has nothing to do with uh, WPF itself, but for parsing XAML files, uh, you need it. And then I'm, you can see here where I'm now taking advantage of being able to break things up. I'm loading utilities and I'm loading a bunch of different things, which we'll see in a minute. I've just defined here my WPF application, and now I'm newing up this calculator view model. I'm doing everything I would do normally. Um, the one thing that I'm doing a little bit different here is when I run inside, when, when this is being launched in a script, WPF, when you write a WPF application, it has to run on an appropriate thread, the app object. So we've got a little helper here that is doing that, this utilities object, which was included from a script. Um, I'll jump over to it in a second. Um, but other than that, it really is just like the kind of code that would get generated, only maybe a little bit less. Um, one of the cool things, which is just a side effect of being able to use script and the fact that all of this actually does get compiled into a single class file is you can put all your usings in one place. 
We only have five minutes? Okay. How are you guys feeling? Are we, <laughs> do you want to go further or do you want to stop in five? Are we able to go further if people want to go further? Yeah, yeah. If, if you want if, if, to. Our deadline is that the parking garage downstairs closes at nine. So. We'll be out way before then, but I can easily go another 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and, and then just we don't want to respect other people because if they people have to catch leave, a bus or something, if they, they want to leave. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, if you want to stick around and hear some more, like I do. <laughs> there's a lot more to see. We haven't even gotten to the NuGet stuff yet. Um, so there's, there's, definitely a lot, there's definitely a lot more to go. Um, but if anybody has to leave, I apologize. But my talk is also available online. Um, and I can post a link to it, the talk that I gave. Plus, this one will be recorded. I think you're going to put that online. Yeah, that sounds like yours is going to be better. The tech end one? Um, did, well, we don't know. This one's not over yet. We'll link it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, this is the utilities class. So what it's doing, and this is really cool that WPF allows you to do this, is it's using XAML Reader to load up a loose XAML file and turn it into an actual user control that my application can then use. And because it's using the view model pattern, it can then bind logic-wise to the view model. So here's the view model, which is just a class inherited from this view model base. And, um, you know, it's got standard view model stuff. It's using the relay command, um, et cetera. So then that stuff is all defined here in this MVVM CSX file. So you can see the kind of reuse and separation going on here. I was able to move those common utilities into an MVVM file that could then be reused across other kinds of scripts that were doing this. Um, and then the actual view itself is right here. This is just a straight old sample file. Now, one of the questions that you might have when you look at this is, this is pretty sophisticated. What if something goes wrong? What's it going to look like? Well, it's going to be like a nasty area that you've seen. But the holy grail would be, could I move to Visual Studio and debug this when I need to? And the answer is you can. Today, it's not as great as it needs to be, but it definitely works, and it's not that hard to set up. So I'm going to show you. You guys want to see that? I don't have 2013 yet. Don't ask me any questions. <laughs> it will be there at some point. It's funny on that. I had somebody asking me to install 2013 right before my talk. And I was like, that's probably not a good idea. In the past, I would have just done it and then, you know, probably blown the talk because I hadn't gotten a chance to really test stuff. So I've, I've learned. Uh, okay, so I have this project created, Script CS Debug. It's a solution, actually. It's not a project. Many of you may not know this, but you can actually open right into Visual Studio an EXE. When you do Open Project Solution, you'll see here it has EXE Project. So a lot of people don't realize you can do that. How many of you, like when you want to like test out an EXE or something, you go and like create another project or attach to it or this kind of thing? you can actually just open an EXE directly. And when you do that, um, you get this interesting solution here that if you click on the properties, it has arguments um, and it has a working directory, et cetera. Now this has changed, dash debug won't work anymore. I think it's now in memory. Actually, I haven't tested this since I just updated. So we're gonna see what happens. Um, so what I did here is I created this project and we show you how to do this on our wiki and I set the execute the executable that I opened when I did the open as exe was scriptcs.exe which was installed from chocolate. So I pointed it at that folder. Then what I do is I set the arguments. So the file that I'm going to run is start.csx and if you come here into scriptcs and you just do scriptcs dash question mark to see the arguments. You see we have this in memory. If you want to be able to debug, um, I think you have to use this. Maybe you don't. We're going to see in a second because I haven't, I actually haven't tested this on the latest version. You used to have to add dash debug, um, but you may not need to do that now. But let's see. Actually, yeah, let's leave that off and see what happens. Um, and then I have to set the working directory. The working directory where the scripts are going to be. Because what this is actually going to do is it's going to launch script CS, the exe. It's going to launch it in a mode where it's able to attach to it. And when we write out our, our final script, 
we add in a bunch of directives that VS understands to enable this step through debugging experience that you're gonna see right now. And again, bear with me because it may not work, but we'll see. All right, so let's try here. So here I have a breakpoint already. So I have a breakpoint. You can see that I'm getting some syntax highlighting here. The reason why I'm getting some syntax highlighting is when you install the Roslyn CTP. So there actually is an MSI that you can install. You don't need it to use script CS. But if you install the CTP, it installs a VS extension that understands the CSX file format. Um, but because Roslyn itself doesn't yet know how to load things, that's why these things are showing as red, because it doesn't actually know they exist, even though they actually do exist. Um, so that is script CS that is adding in that pound load functionality. So let's see what happens here. This I expect to fail, but I could be surprised. Yep, that's okay. Okay, so that didn't fail, but it didn't actually hit the breakpoint. So let's try doing that dash in memory and see if that works. So if I go here. So you can see that I have a view model here, but it's not showing up. But if I look in the watch window, I actually can dig into these things. So I can fully step through and debug. Um, now, because it's script, you could always add the console.logs, like the old ASP 10 days. And a lot of people will do that when they're just kind of dealing with simple stuff. But if you're dealing with more complicated scripts and you really need to get in, you can. And we expect to make this much better. I mean, today you have to kind of create this starter project that you can just keep reusing and just adding your solution files in and setting the right folders. It's not horrible, but it's not what you really want. You really want a way to be able to say that I'm launching in debug mode, up pops Visual Studio, and it just gives me what I need. We do want to do that. We just haven't gotten around to that yet. All right, so we've just seen a lot. Um, but just to recap, you can write in a REPL, you can write standalone scripts, no class required, do procedural code, include other scripts with load, reference assemblies with pound R, including non gap assemblies, do script args uh, to be able to access custom arguments, everything else is c -sharp. That's the first big chunk of what script CS is about. The next part is the one that's a lot more interesting. Um, so I'll, in, in fairness of time, I'll try not to go too long. Um, packages. So everything you've seen at this point has been using stuff that either was in my scripts or was in the GAC. And I said, hey, we're going to make this seamless. We're going to make it so you can use whatever you get packages you want, and it's going to get really easy to do that. So let's just see that. <coughs> so I'm just going to make a folder here called MongoDB. So MongoDB is an example. I, I just like this example. I really like MongoDB, so that's probably why I use this example. Um, MongoDB has a MongoDB client that is available in Unit. So if I was using MongoDB as a NoSQL database and I wanted to be able to talk to it, I would do that with, I, I could do that with the MongoDB NuGet package. So I want to use that package, so what do I have to do in scriptcs? I do scriptcs-install and the package name. So the package name is MongoDB. This is going to go out to the NuGet repository and install MongoDB for me. Now, where does it install it? It installs it in a local packages folder. Why that's interesting is when you look at, say, Node, Node takes an opinion that everything that the app needs is installed locally. Um, so you can just easily delete your Node modules folder and everything goes away. And ScriptCS takes the same idea, which is when you do ScriptCS install, everything shows up in your packages folder. The packages folder doesn't exist, it creates it. But the other thing it does that's nice is I may want to share this with a friend, and I don't want to share the packages themselves. I don't want to put all that in a Git repo. Let's say I was going to have this in a GitHub repo. That's going to make the repo really, really big, or if I'm going to copy it on disk, it's going to be a lot of stuff that I have to copy, or email. 
So what we do is we automatically create for you a packages.config. And we will update that as new packages get installed. And then what that allows you to do is if you do like, if you add this to a Git repo, you can have a Git ignore that says ignore packages. Anybody who then pulls this down, so I will just remove that packages folder, can then just do script cs dash install, and it will look in the packages folder and automatically install those packages into the local packages directory, which is what it's doing now. So we go So if we then uh, look at the packages folder, we can see there's MongoDB. So now what, I told you that we were going to make this experience really simple. So we just saw that it was pretty simple to get. Script CS dash install, know the package name, you got it. What about using it? So I'm a big fan of Ruby on Rails with its whole convention over config thing. And when I started to look at this pound R stuff and specifying DLLs, I'm like, if we can establish some conventions, conventions like everything that's in the packages folder, I care about, and we'll just load it. So there's no need to do pound R. Just drop the package, and the fact that it's there makes it available. So that manifests itself pretty nicely, because I can go into the REPL even, and I can say using like MongoDB. I always mess this up. Okay, so I've just used mongodb.bsum, but you notice I didn't do a pound R. That's because of the fact that we saw the mongodb binaries and we automatically loaded them up. So now I can new up a bsum document, which is a, one of the APIs that's available within mongodb. And then I have a document object, so doc dot get type. which I could then use to be able to, um, to actually talk to MongoDB, create that recent document talk to MongoDB. I'm not going to talk to MongoDB right now, but I just wanted to show you how easy it is now to work with packages. So you still have to know the namespace, but outside of that, you don't have to know what the DLL is, or maybe there's 10 DLLs, but they all may share that MongoDB.bsun namespace or MongoDB namespace. Automatically, they'll all be brought in with that one any questions on that? I say, is this only right after install, or if you tomorrow reopen in the same place? We, we look at it every time. Every time we load, we find whatever's in the packages folder. If I drop a new package, it will show up. If I remove it, it will be there. Yes? Question? Uh, I thought somebody raised their hand. Um, so we would have to be in the MongoDB folder you're in right now. You have to go back. I'm not in the MongoDB folder. Okay. Oh, oh, I'm in. So think of this as my app, right? I'm in the MongoDB folder. Mm -hmm. I have to be in the same folder where the packages are located. Yeah. Um, and this works in script as well. So imagine I wanted to have an automation script that goes and sets up a MongoDB instance and pushes a bunch of data in. That's a great example of where I would want to actually use a script. So there is where I would have a script, like my install.csx. In there, I would do a using MongoDB, and I would have all my MongoDB commands that run. And then I would just run that, just like I would run a batch file. And it would go and talk to MongoDB and do that for me. And so there, I would have a packages.config. If I wanted to share that, I would basically give people the packages.config or tell them you need to do script cs-install to get the MongoDB package. Does that make sense? You're looking a little hazy. What's the... Oh, um, I just, I just am not familiar enough with C Sharp in order to fully follow. I can follow most of it, but I can't... What, what language do you uh, work with? Uh, Java and C. Okay, well Java has like Maven kind of thing. Um, Java has a little bit of a different strategy in terms of how it resolves packages. Um, but the, the with, with, with NuGet, the idea is you have um, like if you use NuGet, if you use Visual Studio, for example, you'll have like your packages within your solution kind of thing. 
We just opted to use this kind of convention because it was something that we saw other languages doing particularly good and, and being pretty successful with it. Any other questions? Yeah? Um, so uh, does it create one of the, there's like a hidden outer class for, for the code that you write. Does it do that per file or is there just like one giant? It's one, it's one giant. So if I have local local variables in one class, they, or one file, they, they're still visible in another file? They are. Okay. Unless you put them in a class. Okay. So you can basically wrap them in your, so you can have inner classes as you saw. So you could have class A and class B, and those could have private variables that are not visible. But yes, ultimately, if you have a bunch of loose, loose script, what's actually going to happen is, like, if you have a pound load, the inner is going to execute first. So if you had an inner file that had some loose script with a pound load, and you have an outer one with some loose script, it's all going to get appended together. And order-wise, the most inner is going to execute first. So they're kind of like partial classes? Not really. Because they actually end up in the same method, but yeah, you, you, partials are a little bit different. Partials are where you're mixing methods in. This is where you have two sets of loose code that actually just right. end up stacked yeah. one on top of the other. So it's not exactly like a partial, um, but it is from a standpoint of like methods. If you have like a method here and a method here, those will end up. If you don't put them in an inner class, those are just going to end up sitting side by side in the general. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. Uh, does this work with any NuGet package? It does. See, there's no processing in it. Um, and have you discovered any packages that have interesting DLLs you may not want to load, like maybe IDE extensions or things like that? Inside? <coughs> because of the nature of the way NuGet works, no. NuGet essentially, like in Visual Studio, when you install a package, pretty much everything that is in those um, library folders get loaded. So we haven't, that hasn't been a problem to me. Um, if it was, then we might have to think about, you know, you, you put in a manifest or something, or we're reading into that. We, we could do that, we haven't had to do that. We've, we've really been on this kind of less is more, and we'll do it when we need to. Um, so, yeah. All right, so now that we have access to NuGet, we can do a lot more. So there's a pretty cool project you guys may have heard of. It's called Web API. Um, it's not the only cool project that's on NuGet, but it's one. And so we have this script CS samples. I keep saying so. And that is going to be my New Year's resolution, is I'm going to start saying so and actually less <laughs> in presentations. A long way. Basically, it's another one. All right. <laughs> I was just about to say so, and I stopped myself. That's impressive. <coughs> Here we have a web API application, completely defined in script. So if I look, there we go. So, so we can see that it's pulling in web API self-host. Because web API has the ability to be hosted outside of IIS. I'm going to run script cs dash install, uh, dash install with nothing else. And that's going to install the packages, which will pull in Web API. So if we look at our packages folder, we can see that it pulled in all of the Web API packages, not just Web API itself, but all the dependencies that Web API has. And then what I can do is do script cs start.csx. And now I have a web server that is listening. So if I go here and I go to localhost test, this is a weird thing that happens. It's actually working. This is parallels. Let me just bring up the page. Let's do that again. There we go. That did work. And it does work. Oh, right. This is a full-blown web API, so I could use Fiddler, for example, and tell it actually what I want to see is JSON. So, so I go into the composer here, and I'll put the same URL, and now I'll put accept application slash JSON. See that it gave me 
feedback and JSON string. That says hello world. So full blown web API. This is interesting because why people like this is the fact that I want to just play around with web API and why do I need to like create a project and everything? I just want to experiment. And this provides a really lightweight way of doing that. So we'll take a look at what the scripts look like. So I've got a bunch of pound loads again, a bunch of usings that I need because I'm using Web API. I need to know what those namespaces are. Um, I'm newing up an HTTP self-host server, and then I'm opening it, and I'm listening. And here's my controller. So I can add another controller, and because Web API discovers stuff via assemblies, it'll just immediately show up. I can add a test controller too. Um, I can show you that. Just go here. I'm going to say test to controller. Yeah, because it's hitting what's in WPF here. Let me close this off. Let's do start. Let's do script CS. Start CSX. Come back here. And go to local host API. Test two. Let's see, we got Hello World. So, really easy to prototype. But it's, there's a couple of problems, which we're going to take a look at in a minute. This is not just about Web API, by the way. So Nancy, you guys heard of Nancy? Nancy is a, another type of web framework, really popular open source framework. Um, and it also has its own packages. So if I do script cs install, it will install the Nancy packages. And I can run Nancy from script as well, which I'll just run in a second. CS start.csx. That's just a convention, by the way. You do not have to call it start.csx. So if I go to HTTP localhost 2234, there we go. Got a Nancy sample running. <laughs> but there's a couple of ugly things um, which I hid from you. So if we dig into the web API host, it all looks nice and pretty, except, you know, I've got these usings and stuff, which we'll, we'll look at in a second. But it gets a little bit ugly as we drill into this guy, which is hidden over here. So one of the things that um, Visual Studio will do for you is it will generate a default route when you use web API. It will generate that in code. If you write your own self-host and you just use a console app, you actually have to add that. That's a little bit annoying. I mean, we could use Sublime Text expansions to do that, but it's one of those things that you feel, why should I even have to do that? If I'm writing a script, I really want to write the bare minimum that I need to to get stuff done. Um, the other problem we ran into, which probably is not a problem now, but it used to be a problem, is that when you compile in memory, we have the ability to compile in memory, and when you compile in memory, it emits an assembly in memory, and frameworks like Web API don't know how to handle that. They don't know today, this is a bug that's been filed, but they don't know how to like look for controllers in assemblies that are in memory. They look for controllers on disk. Now, with the version of Script CS I have running, I probably don't need this because we actually run, um, we actually write to disk by default. That's a, a different story. So if I want to run in memory though, I have to write this thing and I have to like wire it up and configure it. It's a little bit of me. So if I level up and think about you know, packages and what are the pain points behind packages, let me just jump to this slide here. You can see that not everything in script land is pretty. So you can see that I'm, you know, I've got the using statements, um, I've got to new up this server, I have to type that correctly because I don't have IntelliSense whether I'm in the REPL or I'm in Sublime. And then we have this other boilerplate code. So for that, we came up with this concept called script packs, also heavily inspired by Node. 
In Node, when you have a module, you have this concept of modules. A module is an object. So instead of require, instead of having like a reference that you add and then you have to know which types to bring into your namespace and add them, because JavaScript is also typeless, although TypeScript is changing that a little bit, um, you're able to just use this require command in Node and require loads a module that gives you an object. And that object has some convenient methods on it that you can use to get to the next level of whatever you're trying to do. So if you map that to what we're trying to do here, you could imagine saying, ooh, what if I could just somehow get a web API configurated object and say, start. And all that other boilerplate stuff would just be taken care of for me, even using statements. And that is what script CS, uh, what script packs actually will do for you. So if you come over here to our script CS organization, there's a script CS uh, web API so all that code that you saw me write before is going to evaporate to this using the script CS uh, uh, script pack for web API, uh, the script pack for web API. Sorry. So I'm going to show you that. Um, so now what I'm going to do is instead of installing web API. I'm going to install the web API script pack, which is scriptcs.webapi. And that's going to install, and a script pack is just a package, like any other package. But it's a package designed to make working with another framework much easier in script. So I'm going to create a start.csx. So all of that web API code that you saw before has now evaporated to this. The key is right here. So require of t is a special command that we bring into script CS that's available within your scripts that lets you load up script packs. And like what I described to you that we do in Node.js modules, the script pack gives you back an object that just has some convenience methods that you can use to get going. And when you call those methods, it also takes care of all the plumbing. So the default route is still going to get registered, but it's going to get registered for me when I call create server. <coughs> And that special resolver that you saw that I said I needed if I wanted to work with in-memory assemblies is automatically going to get wired up for me. And I don't have to do up an HTTP self-host server or any of that. All I've got to do is call create server, give it a URL, and it will then give me back an object, which actually is the self-host server. So it's giving me the same object back. It's just providing a really nice lightweight factory to get me there and just getting rid of a lot of code in the process. So now if I jump back over here and say script cs start.csx, oh, script cs. It tells me that there is a server listening. Where is the server listening? It's listening on 8080. Now this time, we didn't use API in the route. Um, we just have server and the controller that I'm trying to access. Thank you. It's a little one day. Hello world. But there's a ton of really interesting script packs that are out there. So script packs really are about providing an ecosystem which all you guys, or anybody who's using script CS, can create script packs to make things easier to use. And we have a post on how to author them. So just to show you the list of what's out there today, and the number keeps growing. Um, if you go to the script CS repo, you'll see we have a wiki. And on the wiki, we have a list of script packs 
So there's one for Azure Media Services, Azure Mobile Services. I'm going to show you this CLR Diagnostics one because it's pretty slick. There's a Nancy one. So to write the Nancy sample also has a bunch of boilerplate. But if you use Require Nancy, it just makes that really easy and it evaporates that. Also, one thing to point out, notice there's no usings here. The script pack actually has the ability to provide the common using statements that make sense for doing what you're trying to do. You can still access other usings, but it can inject those in. And it does in the case of Web API. It injects the three. Yeah? Is it an injection or is it more of like an AMP type thing? This is, so, okay. Is it, in, it is not AMD. What it is doing is script packs get involved in terms of contributing references at the time when the script itself is going to get compiled. So it is able to just simply inject additional uh, references in that will then get passed off to Roslyn or whatever compiler it is. We do have a way to do some pretty slick rewriting as well. We have extensibility, which I'm not going to get into now. You can actually change C sharp. We have extensibility points now where you could add your own aliases, you could add your own commands even to the language because you have a hook where you can actually hook in at the time when the file is being parsed and say, I want to look at the text and do like a search and replace. Wherever this is used, replace it to this. So you can do some pretty interesting things. Our intent was not to make C sharp malleable, but to some degree, we made C sharp malleable, at least from a standpoint of using script CS. The downside of doing that, of course, is it's not going to be easy to upgrade that project from being a script to a full-fledged project if you get to that point. But that's a trade-off decision that you guys can make. Just to show you what a script pack looks like. And then we're going to be done. And I appreciate very much you guys staying there little longer. The key thing about the script pack, so there's this other technology that I worked on called the Managed Extensibility Framework. And actually, ScriptCS is using MEF to discover the script packs. So you're installing <laughs> NuGet packages, and those NuGet packages have MEF contracts within them that ScriptCS knows to look for. And the contract that it looks for is this iScriptPack interface, which we define within our, um, within our NuGet package for, for contracts. So here you can see that when I've implemented iScriptPack, I get a few things. I get this get context method. Now, when I did this script that I had before, so if I go to um, Sublime again, I did this require web API. If you look over here, you see that I'm returning on this get context call a web API object. That is the actual type that you're using when you do the require. So we look at the type of the thing that was returned. We pull on this get context method when we find the script packs. We look at the type of the thing that you returned us, and that gets put in a dictionary, keyed off of the type. And when you do require web API, that's why we're able to say, oh, you mean this. Um, in this initialize, you can see that I'm getting past this session object, and I'm able to add additional namespaces in there. So those are those namespaces that I basically removed the customer from having to type in. And then the real magic happens here in this web API object, which is just plain old C sharp code. So there's the create server method. And the create server method is basically wiring up, there I go with basically again, wiring up that controller resolver that I showed you. Here's where it's configuring the route. So it's essentially doing the same thing that I would have to do by hand, but it's getting rid of me having to do it by hand and making life easier in the process. There's one for WPF, which would mean writing that calculator example. I wouldn't need that utilities script. I could just require WPF, and it will give me those helper methods that I had to write. So that's really the idea. Um, the very last demo I'm going to show you then we're actually done, is everything you've seen here is running from the command line, running within script CS, running within the rebel. But what if I wanted to add scripting to 
an existing application. Imagine that calculator was a product that I ship, and I want to say to customers, if you want to write your own operators, just write a script. But now it's not loading up into script CS EXE, it's loading up within your application. We have a script CS, and I love this slide, so I'll show it to you. We have a hosting library, so you can embed script CS within your applications. And that is available as well on NuGet. And with that hosting library, you can do some really interesting things, like even being able to host scripts within a standard ASP.NET application. But we can go even further than that because once we're hosted scripts, we're hosting scripts within script CS, we could even tweak the authoring of controllers to make it more interesting. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Imagine that was a controller. So I have no class. All I have is a function called get, which maps against an HTTP method called get. I, there will be a class, because script CS will take care of making sure that that class gets injected at the time when the script gets built up. But what's the class name? What's the controller name? It's the file name. So it's very dry. It's very do not repeat yourself. I name a file called test.csx, the controller will be test controller. I name a file called foo.csx, it will be foo controller. And then we have, so anybody who knows me from my web API days knows how big of a fan I am of contact managers. Um, so we brought it back. We have contacts again. Here you can see, though, that not only do I have a method on this contact.csx called get, but I'm returning a thing called contact. Well, where is that contact coming from? Well, here what we have is the notion of being able to drop models into a models folder. Now, this will take a second to get used to, but imagine that is actually a model. It's just a property right now, but at runtime, it will be a class called contact that has a property called name. And if I jump back over to that uh, first example I showed you, test, I'm newing up this thing called helpers. Well, where is helpers coming from? Well, helpers is living in a shared folder, and it's called helpers.csx. So because of that, that will get created into a helpers class, which I can then new up within my controller, my test controller here, um, and access it and use those functions. So this is hosting of script CS within ASP.NET, a standard IAS application, but then it's going further into enhancing the programming model to remove some of the corrupt even further. This is beyond just using statements. It, it's actually getting rid of the need to write a class at all. But the question is, will it run? <laughs> it used to run. Let's see if it still does. <laughs> And then we'll actually go, well, it says the service is up and running. That's, that's a good sign. Okay. So that is that helper method that I called running and passing its output. So when I did this API slash test, I basically invoked the test controller, which was calling this helpers.getType info and passing it a few types. Now what's important here is this is an actual controller at runtime. And you can see that here. This class is called test controller, and it actually derives from API controller. So I can fully access all the members that the controller has to offer, even though I didn't author the class. Anyway, this is just one example of what's possible with hosting. You could host within a desktop application. There's lots of other interesting things that are happening. We're running out of time. Uh, so I'm done from a kind of a demo perspective, everything I wanted to show you. Um, I wanted to lastly just reiterate the fact that this is an open source project on GitHub. It's been getting a lot of contributors, a lot of energy around it. Um, we'd love for you guys to contribute if you like what you see. Um, or if you don't like what you see, you can contribute to change it. 
So that's at github.com slash scriptcs slash scriptcs. Um, and it's just a quick summary of what we've seen here. Um, the one thing we didn't touch on is PowerShell. Like, why, should I use PowerShell? Is this trying to kill PowerShell? It is not trying to kill PowerShell. And there's a lot of things that PowerShell can do that ScriptCS is not designed to do. The thing that ScriptCS is saying is, look, if you know C Sharp, and the thing that you can do can be achieved in C Sharp, you can do it with ScriptCS. Whereas with PowerShell, I have to learn a completely different language and a completely different shell. But they're both useful, and you can actually integrate the two. And there's a guy, Jim Christopher, who wrote a PowerShell module that lets you actually pipe and into ScriptCS and out of ScriptCS and leverage ScriptCS from within your PowerShell scripts. That's a mind blow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. And we don't care about that.